Good afternoon. Thank you all for attending today's roundtable on the Trademark Modernization Act Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. This roundtable is being recorded and will be made available for viewing on the USPTO website within two to three weeks. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the roundtable, please email virtualevents at USPTO.gov for assistance. If you have questions for the panel, please send an email to tm underscore webinar at USPTO.gov. The panel will answer as many questions as possible during today's session. Now I will turn it over to the Commissioner for Trademarks, David Gooder, to provide opening remarks. Commissioner Gooder? Thanks, Tasha. Good afternoon, everyone. In a few minutes, you'll be hearing from Amy Cotton, uh, the Deputy Commissioner for Trademark Examination Policy here at the USPTO. Amy is going to take you through the proposed rules to implement the Trademark Modernization Act of 2020. Before she does so, however, I wanted to share with you a couple of thoughts about the TMA. If you haven't already heard, you will shortly. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the enactment of the Lanham Act. Our trademark law has stood the test of time, and important amendments over the years have been few but significant, such as the case with the TMA. When the Lanham Act was passed, the world was a very different place, and the challenges we face today with regard to the integrity of our register and its registrations simply wasn't part of the landscape. The TMA, though, has come along at an opportune time, and in implementing it, we wanted to do two things differently than we've done in the past. First, we sought comments from stakeholders and our customers on their initial thoughts about implementation. This was before we wrote and published the draft so that we could include many of these comments in the draft. Second, we included in this draft a number of options for some of the rules and procedures. Our thought was that by doing this, we will be able to receive productive comments in areas where more than one good option is possible. In this way, when the final rule is published, we will be confident that the rules have been well thought through, effective, and generally supported by the trademark community. As I prepared my remarks today, my thoughts turned to the protection of our trademark register, which is one of the bedrocks of our trademark ecosystem. Quite simply, the integrity of our register ensures that brand owners are able to protect their intellectual property and succeed in both the US and global markets. It's for this reason that protecting the integrity of the U.S. Trademark Register is and will remain for some time one of our top priorities. And in that vein, we welcome the Trademark Modernization Act as we believe it will contribute in a significant way towards that goal. So enough from me. Uh, without further ado, I want to pass the mic over to Amy Cotton. Amy? Thanks, Dave. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here with you again today, um, as I was back in March when we uh, started this process of, of trying to figure out how to implement the Trademark Modernization Act. I'm here today alongside my distinguished colleagues to share our plans for implementation. I have, of course, uh, Commissioner Gooder. I've got Chief Judge Gerard Rogers with me and uh, also uh, Robert Lavash, Senior Trademark Legal Policy Advisor, uh, to help uh, answer your questions today. The Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, I'm going to call it the, T the MPRM. So if I refer to the MPRM, that's that the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, it's the rule package. Um, the, the, the MPRM issued on May 18th. We were happy to, to be a little bit of ahead of schedule. Um, the comment period is 60 days. That means that your written formal comments are due to the regulations.gov portal by July 19th. Again, your comments are due by July 19th. They must be submitted to the regulations.gov uh, portal in order to be included in the records of the formal rulemaking process. The MPRM contains proposals uh, that amend the existing letter of protest rule to indicate that letter of protest determinations are final and non-reviewable, establish flexible office action response periods, it establishes ex parte expungement and reexamination proceedings for cancellation of a registration when the required use and commerce of the registered mark has not been made, provide for new non-use ground for cancellation before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. The rule package also sets fees for petition requesting institution of ex parte expungement and reexamination proceedings and fees for requests to extend office action response deadlines. 
the rule package also has amendments uh, for suspension of USPTO proceedings and the rules governing attorney recognition in trademark matters. And finally, a new rule is proposed to address procedures regarding court orders canceling um, affected registrations. All rules in the NPRM are subject to change based on the formal comments received that you all send us. These rules will not take effect until the date that's indicated in the final rule. Uh, for expungement and reexamination, though, implementation is required by December 27, 2021. For flexible response periods, the TMA does not dictate a date of implementation. Uh, and the USPTO has proposed in the rule package that it actually be delayed six months to June 27, 2022. That will help your docketing system and ours. Any input we receive today via email or through the folks providing comments or questions online is considered informal and will not form part of the formal rulemaking record unless those comments are also submitted in writing to federalregulations.gov. Starting with letters of protest. You may remember the USPTO issued rules formalized, formalizing the letter of protest procedures consistent with the TMA at the end of last year. Now we're just tweaking rule 2.149 to mirror the statutory language that any determination by the USPTO director whether to include letter of protest evidence in the record of an application shall be final and non-reviewable and that such determination shall not prejudice any party's right to, rely, to raise that issue or rely on that evidence in any other proceeding. I would note, because I've gotten questions on this point, that codifying the existing letter of protest procedure has not resulted in any changes to the practices that have been in place for many years, except for two things. One, there's now a fee of $50 for a letter of protest to cover our costs. Uh, and also, uh, we now have two months in which to make a determination on whether to send the evidence submitted by the protester to the examining attorney for consideration. But those are the only two changes uh, that this uh, rule package makes. Next, I wanted to move on to, this, to the second big bucket uh, in the TMA, flexible response periods. Uh, I wanted to point out that the NPRM presents one option uh, in the rule text, but offers two other options on which we also seek comments. All options would apply to response periods in examination as well as in post-registration. However, the shortened response period would not apply to Section 66A Madrid applications. The various treaty provisions and procedures in the Madrid system for the International Registration of Marks at the World Intellectual Property Organization would make it very difficult for international applicants and registrants to meet any of those shortened response deadlines in the United States. So we just carve those out. So we have three options, as I said. Option one, three-month response period. We're proposing a standard three-month response period for all office actions extendable one time to the full six months. We're proposing an extension fee of $125 per request. This is not a per class fee, but a per request fee. Our original thinking was that we might wish to propose a shortened period for only those responses to office actions that contain simple requirements. However, it became pretty difficult to distinguish which office actions would be considered simple and which would be more complex without leaving it up to an individual examining attorney on a case-by-case -case basis. So a bright line rule seemed easier for everyone's docketing system and consistent with the intent of the TMA, uh, and we have reflected this proposal in the NPRM rule text. Option two is the two-phase examination. Uh, this is ex explained in the explanatory part of the TMA, the rule package, and it proposes two separate response periods that could form the basis for implementing a two-phase examination system. <clears throat> the first phase, phase would be for a formalities examination featuring a two-month response period. Under the TMA, though, this would have to be extendable up to uh, the full six months, two months by two months, upon request and payment of the fee. The second phase of examination would be for substantive issues, um, and that would have a three-month response period also extendable up to the full six months. But if you do the math, you realize that this option actually could result in a total increase in pendency um, for a particular application if all the extensions were pursued. But we're, we're looking at ways to enhance examination flexibility to handle formalities issue first and then handle uh, substantive examination separately in a second office action. The third option is the patent model. Um, it's also contained in the explanatory section of the MPRM. The initial response period in every case would be two months, but it could be extended in increments up to the full six months. The applicant would have to file an extension request and a fee within the response period, and the extension fees would get progressively higher as the applicant requests more time to respond. 
So for example, an extension fee could be $50 to request the third month, 75 for the fourth month, 125 for the fifth month, and 150 when the full six months is requested. Now the application would be abandoned if the deadline is missed without an extension request, but of course to, re to revive, the petition to revive must include the applicable extension fee uh, depending on when the petition is filed after the initial missed deadline. So we're looking for comments on which of these three options would be most useful to you and to the USPTO, or if you have further options that, that you're interested in, you could submit those in your comments as well. Now we're gonna move on to the third big bucket uh, in the TMA, which is the non-use cancellation mechanisms. The, proposed, uh, the TMA proposed new proceedings to cancel registrations for non-use, and we are proposing the procedures that would implement those. Uh, the first proceeding is expungement. The target of these proceedings is a mark in a section 1, 44, or 66 registration. So that's a use-based, a Paris-based, or Madrid-based registration that has never been used on some or all of the goods or services identified in the registration. The petition to request institution of expungement proceedings may be filed in the window of time between th year 3 and year 10 post-registration. The TMA also provides that expungement is a new ground for cancellation at the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. However, the timing is a bit different for a TTAB claim. claim. The claim is available at any time after the first three years post-registration. It does not cut off at year 10 like the proceedings before the director. You can bring those claims at any time after three years. Uh, please note that this new claim of expungement does not affect any other already available non-use claim at the TTAB, that is abandonment or non-use, nor does it impact the timing of those claims. Uh, a further point on the timing of expungement petitions, the TMA also provides that for the two years following implementation, a petition for expungement may be filed against a registration that's over 10 years old. The intent of this provision was to allow for clearance of older Deadwood off of the register for a two-year period following implementation, uh, but it, it is a short window in which any registration may be subject to a proceeding uh, for expungement before the director. Now the second new type of proceeding is called re-examination. Uh, the target of these proceedings is a mark in a Section 1 use-based registration that was not in use as of the relevant date. Now what's the relevant date? For a Section 1A application filing date, presuming that it was never amended to a Section 1B filing basis, the relevant date for purposes of a intent to use a 1B application is the later of the filing date of the amendment to allege use or the expiration of time to file the statement of use. Now the timing, the window here, a petition to request institution of reexamination, it must be filed in the first five years after registration. For both expungement and reexamination, once the window for requesting proceedings is closed, depending on which one you're, you're looking at, these tools are no longer available before the director. However, any interested party can always bring a claim at the TTAB or federal district court for non-use or, or abandonment or expungement as appropriate. All right, the MPRM lays out the matching procedures that will be followed in both expungement and reexamination proceedings. Now we are proposing a $600 per class petition fee. The fee is designed to strike the balance between cost recovery and providing a less expensive alternative to a contested TTAB proceeding. Now any person may file a petition requesting that either expungement or reexamination proceedings be instituted. Only one registration per petition will be allowed. The basis for the petition must either be expungement or reexamination, but not both in the same petition. Combining them into one petition creates IT difficulties and could be problematic for examination because the evidence for the different bases will be different. So, but even if uh, a, a petition for expungement and peti petition for reexamination on the same registration were filed separately, the director can consolidate review of the multiple petitions against the same registration. Now, the TMA, TMA says any person can file. So the statute itself makes clear that there should be no standing requirement for the petitioner. The petitioner is not anonymous because the petition must be filed through TEAS, and that means that it must be filed through a USPTO.gov account. Also, the petitioner must provide a domicile address so that we can determine if the petitioner is foreign domiciled and thus would need to include the designation of a U.S. attorney in the petition. 
If an attorney is designated, the petition must include the attorney name, postal address, email address, and bar information. Now, if a petition is filed but it's incomplete, um, the USPTO may issue a 30-day letter to address the missing information. Now, I wanted to circle back to the anonymity question that I do get a lot. I wanted to note the USPTO is not currently proposing that the petitioner be required to identify the real party in interest. Now, we're doing this for two reasons. First, if the petitioner establishes a prima facie case of non-use, it makes no difference for purposes of adhering to the intent of the TMA who that petitioner is or whom he or she is representing. The ultimate goal of the proceedings is to clear Deadwood from the register regardless of who requested those proceedings. Secondly, once the petitioner files the petition, the petitioner is out of the process. To hold the, petition, to hold the petitioner accountable in the context of these proceedings for failing to provide accurate information as to the real party in interest would require the petitioner to remain a party to the proceeding throughout, but that was not the intent of the TMA. Instead, we believe that a petitioner who uses the proceedings to harass registrants could be sanctioned outside the context of the proceedings. That is through the sanction authority of the Commissioner for Trademarks. The Commissioner for Trademarks may sanction individuals making submissions to the USPTO for improper purpose. So if the USPTO were to discover through our ongoing investigations for fraudulent and bad faith submissions, that a petitioner was abusing these proceedings, the USPTO could preclude submissions in any proceeding before the USPTO by the petitioner and the party the petitioner may be representing and could terminate any USPTO.gov account created by that bad actor. As an example, the ethical duty of candor that applies to any party practicing before the USPTO would be violated and subject to sanctions if the petitioner did not disclose all material facts known that would enable the office to make an informed decision whether or not the facts were adverse. This would, of course, include situations where the petitioner knew that a mark was in use, but the petition alleges that it was not. Now, once a complete petition is filed, we're going to send a courtesy email notice of the filing to the registrant and the registrant's attorney of record uh, as appropriate. The petition and evidence will also be uploaded immediately into the Trademark Status and Document Retrieval, TSDR, system, and they will be made public. No response from the registrant to the filing of the petition will be accepted unless and until proceedings are instituted. Now, the petition must include a verified statement that identifies the elements of the petitioner's investigation of non-use. Where did you search? How did you search? When did you search? And what did you find? as to each source of information relied on. Now, the reasonable of the search and the number and the nature of the sources the petitioner must search will be determined case by case. The evidence of non-use that's sought will ne necessarily differ depending on the nature of the goods and the services um, at issue and their relevant channels of trade and advertising. The sources must be reasonably accessible and ones that can be publicly disclosed. Appropriate sources of evidence and information for a reasonable investigation may include, but are not limited to, those you see here, state and federal trademark records, internet websites and other media likely to or believed to be owned or controlled by the registrant, internet websites, on other online media and publications where the relevant goods and services would likely be advertised or offered for sale, print sources and web pages likely to contain reviews or discussions of the relevant goods and services, Records of filing made with or of actions taken by any state or federal business registration or regulatory agency. The registrant's marketplace activities, including, for example, any attempts to contact the registrant or purchase the relevant goods or services. Records of litigation or administrative proceedings reasonably likely to contain evidence on the registrant's use or non-use of the registered mark. And, of course, any other reasonably accessible source with information establishing that the mark was never in use in commerce for expungement or was not in commerce as of the relevant date, re-examination, or on, or on or in connection with the relevant goods and services. Now, the director is the gatekeeper to the process and decides whether the prima facie case is made based on the evidence and, avail uh, evidence and information in the petition, and also the USPTO's electronic record of the involved registration. The director has the authority to institute a proceeding without a petition if the director has evidence establishing a prima facie case. So there's petition-based and there's director-initiated proceedings. 
So for example, the director could institute a proceeding on different goods and services in the same registration that's already the subject of a petition initiated proceeding. Of course, the director can consolidate review of both proceedings in that, on that same registration. The consolidated proceedings are related parallel proceedings that may include both expungement and reexamination grounds. Now, a prima facie case requires only that a reasonable predicate concerning non-use be established. If a prima facie case is established, the director must institute proceedings. And if proceedings are instituted, just as in examination, the burden of proving non-use by proponents of the evidence lies with the director. If a prima facie case is not established in the petition itself, the director will not institute petition-based proceedings. The director will not add evidence to a deficient petition to establish a prima facie case and institute proceedings. But, however, uh, director, if the director has his own evidence and establishes a prima facie case, the director can institute proceedings on his own initiative without that petition. Once proceedings are instituted, an office action will issue that directs the registrant to respond within two months with proof of use of the mark on the challenged goods or services. The director's decision to institute proceedings based on a prima facie case is final and non-reviewable. With two months to respond, the registrant is subject to the USPTO's rules on electronic correspondence, the requirement to correspond electronically with the office, domicile address, and representation by U.S. counsel if foreign domiciled. The registrant has three options for his or her response. Number one, provide evidence of use. Number two, excusable non-use in certain circumstances, and or three, deletion is the third option. Starting with providing evidence of use. The registrant must provide such evidence of use, information, exhibits, affidavits, or declarations that may be necessary to rebut the prima facie case by establishing that the required use in commerce has been made on or in connection with the goods and services at issue as required by the Lanham Act. Any documentary, sorry, any documentary evidence of use need not be specimens of use in, in uh, Section 1A of the Act, but they must be consistent with the definition of use in commerce in Section 45 of the Lanham Act. Specimens are typically what will be provided, uh, but there may be situations where, where the specimens are no longer available, and in these cases, the registrant can provide additional evidence and explanations supported by declaration. Resubmitting the same exact specimens already contained in the USPTO's records without additional evidence will likely be insufficient to rebut the prima facie case. Keep in mind that the office already reviewed the USPTO's records to determine whether to institute proceedings. Testimonial evidence may be submitted but should be supported by corroborating documentary evidence. For expungement, the proof of use must show that the use occurred before the filing date of the petition. For reexamination, the proof of use must show that the use occurred on or before the relevant date. Now on the second option for response, excusable non-use, this only applies to Section 44 Paris or Section 66 registrants in the context of an expungement proceeding. Excusable non-use is a treaty entitlement for Paris and Madrid registrants and does not apply to Section 1 registrants. It only, it only applies in expungement uh, because Section 44 and 66 registrants did not have to establish use in examination as a condition for registration that would now be questioned in a reexamination proceeding. The third response option is deletion. A registrant may delete some or all of the challenged goods and services in his response with immediate effect. A registrant may not amend an identification in the context of these proceedings. Actually, we, we received a question ahead of time about whether any regulatory allowances would be made for registrants in an expungement or reexamination proceeding who are affected by a mistake made by counsel in the initial application when identifying the goods and services. So, a fact pattern where this might be at issue is if the proof of use offered does not match the identification of the goods and services being challenged, maybe because the applicant initially made the mistake in identifying the goods and services in his application or the, or the attorney did so, and they never fixed that mistake. Again, the registrant may not amend the ID to match the proof of use in the context of these expungement reexamination proceedings. Remember, these are supposed to be short proceedings, uh, so we can't have a lot of additional issues added. However, there is a way forward here. The registrant could file a Section 7 amendment to narrow the ID within the scope of the original ID 
and notify that amendment to the expungement or reexamination examiner for consideration if the, registra if the registrant did not already do so prior to the proceedings. However, keep in mind that we cannot guarantee that the Section 7 amendment would be accepted. We would not suspend the expungement reexamination proceedings while the Section 7 um, examination was going on, but we will expedite consideration of the Section 7. Remember, we want to keep these proceedings fast, efficient, and, and low cost. So I hope that answers the question uh, that was posed prior to this roundtable. If the registrant's response proposes deletion, but this deletion occurs while the registration is also subject to a post-registration examination of the Section 8 or 71 declaration, a deletion fee of $250 per class will be due. I want to note specifically that we are not proposing to charge a deletion fee in the context of the expungement or reexamination proceedings. But if the deletion uh, in, the, in the registrant's response occurs at the same time that the maintenance filing is being examined, then we will charge the deletion fee. I know that's a little confusing, but you can understand that we, want, we don't want folks to avoid the post-registration deletion fee simply because they're the subject of an expungement or reexamination proceeding at the same time. So deletion can occur in the registrant's response, but a registrant may also delete goods and services through a Section 7 amendment. The Section 7 amendment must be notified by the registrant in his or her response to the expungement or reexamination examiner so that they know that it, it was made. Also, a registrant may delete goods and services just by voluntarily surrendering the entire registration. This surrender must also be notified to the expungement or reexamination examiner in the registrant's response for that response to be acceptable. Now, ultimately, if one of these three responses uh, is acceptable, the proceedings terminate immediately and no cancellation order issues. No response by the registrant means immediate cancellation for the goods and services on which the proceeding was instituted. Now, a petition for reinstatement is available if the failure to respond was due to extraordinary circumstances and the typical time periods for filing a petition supply. Now, if you are filing the petition to reinstate, the response to the outstanding office action would also be required at that time along with the petition and the fee. This, proce this process should not be used to prolong the registrant's overall response period. The MPRM adjusts the due diligence monitoring rules such that registrants must monitor the status of their registration at least every two months after notice of institution of proceedings. Now, if it, the response is unacceptable or it's incomplete, a final action issues with a two-month response period. Now, actually, we've asked for comments uh, in the MPRM on whether we should issue a 30-day letter for a timely, bona fide attempted response to the first office action, but which omits some matter of compliance. So we'd like to hear your views on that. But I wanted to go back to the issue of deletions and flag two issues for consideration uh, as you uh, prepare your formal comments. The MPRM requests comments on whether a registrant who fails to respond to the first office action should have his or her registration flagged for later audit, post-registration audit. This means that from a best practices perspective, not responding to an office action and just simply trying to allow a deletion to occur without affirmatively responding to delete the challenge goods and services, that, that practice would no longer really be an option. Our thought in asking for comments about this audit process is that a registrant who simply does not respond may have bigger problems in his or her registration for which evidence of non-use was not available, but in fact, the mark was not in use for more goods and services in the registration that, that than were originally challenged. If we target it for later audit, we can find out if the rest of the registration that was not challenged in the proceeding holds up under for further scrutiny by our post-registration examiners. But we are aware that such a policy could raise another issue for foreign domiciliaries who may wish to not respond to an office action because they don't want to have to get U.S. counsel in order to affirmatively respond. They might prefer to just let the challenge goods and services fall away and avoid having to hire an attorney to make that uh, deletion or surrender the registration. Uh, and, but they might want to avoid the, the, the later audit. So we're looking for comments on whether we should provide for a way 
for a foreign domicil domiciled registrant to be able to respond to the office action and simply delete the goods and services without having U.S. counsel to do so. Now, the final action uh, in an expungement proceeding will include the examiner's decision in that registration um, that the goods and services that were challenged, that the mark, um, the registration should be canceled for each goods or service for which the mark as determined to have never been used in commerce or for which excusable non-use was not established or for non-compliance with any requirement under Rule 2.11, U.S. Council Rule, under Rule 2.23, failure to provide an email address for electronic correspondence, or Rule 2.189, failure to provide a domicile address. The final action for a reexamination proceeding includes the decision to cancel the registration for each good or service for which the mark was not in use on or before the relevant date or for noncompliance with the same rules that I just mentioned, 2.11, 2.23, and 2.189. The registrant must respond to the final action with the examiner's decision to cancel with a request for reconsideration and a notice of appeal. Now, if there is no response to the final action, the USPTO will terminate proceedings and order cancellation of the goods and services at issue. A petition for reinstatement is available, but only for an extraordinary situation. But if the request for reconsideration contains acceptable proof of use, we will terminate proceedings. Otherwise, the examiner's decision to cancel is appealed to the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, and the regular board timelines will apply. Now, there is an estoppel provision in the TMA so that goods and services for which use in commerce has already been established may not be subject to further expungement or reexamination proceedings. But of course, there's a nuance here. If a registration was subject to an expungement proceeding where proof of use was provided as to the challenged goods and services, no further expungement proceedings on those same identical goods and services may be instituted. However, further reexamination proceedings on those same goods or services are not barred because the reexamination proceedings involve a question of whether the mark was in use uh, as of a particular relevant date. So the proof of use relied on to defend against an expungement proceeding might not be the same proof of use you would need to defend against a reexamination proceeding, which is tied to the relevant date on which the mark was supposed to be in use. Now, I think it bears uh, noticing that the TMA estoppel provisions do not apply to subsequent board proceedings. In other words, even if a registration is subject to an expungement or reexamination proceeding before the director, that registration may still be challenged at the TTAB on a claim of expungement, abandonment, or non-use as appropriate. As for the pending proceedings, we cannot institute expungement proceedings on the same goods and services if an expungement proceeding on those same goods and services is already pending. Like, likewise, we will not institute either an expungement or reexamination proceeding if a reexamination proceeding is already pending on those same goods and services. We will deny the later filed petition unless it happens to cover goods and services not already subject, not already the subject of an instituted proceeding. Now, expungement and reexamination proceedings uh, in the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking are included now among the types of proceedings for which suspension of action by the office or the TTAB is authorized. The Notice of Proposed Rulemaking also proposes to amend the, the rules to reflect our current suspension practice. So generally, as you know, the TTAB will suspend proceedings when another proceeding that is relevant to registrability of the involved mark is ongoing. The rule is currently written such that the suspension practice is limited to proceedings where the exact same party or parties are engaged in the other proceeding. We want to propo we're proposing in the NPRM to amend the rule to reflect our actual practice, to look at the relevance of the proceedings to the registrability of the registration rather than to strictly look at the parties to the, both, to the two proceedings. Now, some of you might like visuals. Uh, the Commissioner for Trademarks likes visuals, so I have prepared this one for you. This is an overview of the expungement and reexamination proceeding. These slides will be, will be posted on our website, so you can certainly take a closer look later. But let me walk you through this uh, simplified version. The process begins with a petition against the registration that goes to the examiner. There are two possible outcomes. The institution decision which would be combined with the issuance of the first office action, or denial of institution. The next two steps have a two-month time frame where the reg registrant submits either an acceptable response or an unacceptable response or otherwise does not respond. 
if the registrant does not respond, there's immediate cancellation of the goods and services and potentially that registration is tagged for later audit. Now, if a response comes in, the examiner will review the response, and there are three possible outcomes from the examiner's review of the response. If the response is successful because it establishes use, excusable non-use, or deletes the challenge goods and services, the proceeding is over. It's terminated. No cancellation order. A second option is the final office action will issue because the response was not acceptable or there was no response. Or thirdly, um, cancellation of the challenge uh, goods and services uh, because there was no response um, or deletion. The next two steps have a two-month time frame. If the proceeding is not successful, the registrant can either file a request for reconsideration or an appeal. Again, the registrant could choose not to respond but could eventually, potentially face a later audit of the rest of the registration. The examiner will review the request for consideration or it will go to the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board to handle that appeal. At that point, if uh, the request for reconsideration is acceptable because proof of use was offered and accepted, the proceeding is, su is successful and the, it terminates or otherwise uh, the, the mark is canceled um, after the board proceeding. So that's a visual and you'll certainly will have time to study that later. Now moving on to a few other areas that are covered by the MPRM. So these proposed attorney recognition rules are not part of our TMA implementation necessarily, but are driven by the needs to have clear correspondence rules for the office and to implement provisions of our database login project. First of all, sort of as an over, overarching comment, I want to note that the, these proposed rules move from using the term representation to using the term recognition. The USPTO recognizes representatives for the purpose of determining who is authorized to act for the applicant or the registrant before the office. We do not control the actual representation agreement between the attorney and the client, so we are changing the wording of the rule to make that clear and to reflect the reality. Now, under our current rules, recognition ends when an application is abandoned, a registration expires or is canceled, or it changes ownership. Under the proposed rule in the MPRM, recognition would instead continue after all those events. So that means in order to end the recognition of the attorney by the USPTO, owners and attorneys would be required to proactively file an appropriate revocation or withdrawal document rather than the current situation where recognition automatically ends. We want to make this change to our rules in order to match our practice. The background for this li change lies with our correspondence rules. The USPTO is supposed to correspond only with the applicant or registrant if the applicant or registrant is not represented by an attorney. So, if recognition has ended after certain events, we should stop sending correspondence to the attorney's correspondence address. But we don't, because stakeholders told us not to follow our correspondence rule. Attorney stakeholders told us they wanted to continue receiving correspondence so they could be sure of when the post-registration filings were due, for example, to get that courtesy email reminder that a maintenance filing is due. So we want to uh, change our rules to reflect the practice that we actually uh, undertake right now. Now, additionally, this rule change uh, will facilitate implementation of the role-based access control system for applications of registrations that we're developing. So, as you may be aware, uh, as part of the USPTO's forthcoming identity verification process for database login, users are likely to be assigned a limited number of roles to control and delegate access to filings, including attorney, attorney support, owner, and public administrator roles. So these roles will tell us who is authorized to touch a certain application or registration for purposes of uh, controlling the security of our database to make sure that unauthorized parties can't amend an application or file a change of correspondence address or, or the like. Now, if we were to maintain our current rule, in order to submit the TS form to file a maintenance document on behalf of a client, the role-based access controls would require the no longer recognized attorney to first request IT permission from the owner in order to file and we're concerned that, that could, it could end up with missed deadlines, having to add a, a separate process to the process of filing 
uh, maintenance document. So we really would like to fix um, the rule in order to match our practice and allow us to assign rules for access controls to tighten up our database security and uh, protect the integrity of the register. Now we're also proposing a rule to change uh, that would clarify the attorney obligations when withdrawing from representation and differentiate the grounds under which the attorney must request, I'm sorry, where to differentiate the situations where the attorney may request to withdraw versus those situations where the attorney must request withdrawal. And there really should be no surprises there. But this will allow us to be consistent with the USPTO rules of professional conduct. Now, la oh. lastly, uh, in the rule package, we uh, have a proposed rule uh, that is also unrelated to TMA, but it's simply to codify the USPTO's longstanding procedures concerning court action, I'm sorry, concerning action on court orders, canceling or affecting a registration under 15 USC 1119. The USPTO requires submission of a certified copy of the court order and normally does not, on act, does not act on such orders until the case is finally determined. We're simply embedding the practice into a rule. There we go. So that was a long summary of the rule package, but it was designed to facilitate your efforts to provide formal comments uh, to regulations.gov. Wanted to flag those issues where we are looking for at different options and we'd like input on the option that you prefer. We are hoping that you will help us refine this rule package into a rule, a final rule that we can all be comfortable with. Now here's the information about how to submit formal comments. And of course, remember the deadline of July 19th. If you are looking for these slides or you're looking for a recording of this roundtable or uh, a way to send questions uh, to the USPTO about the TMA, here is a reference slide for you. Uh, go to this web to our website and you'll see uh, all the information that we have available. Uh, you'll see information about the second of these two uh, roundtables on June 14th. Uh, and the email box to which you can send informal comments. Again, informal comments will not be considered part of the formal rulemaking record. Uh, if you want them considered in the record, they need to go to regulations.gov. Now, one thing I did, if I can get there, uh, is I put together three reference slides for you uh, so you can go back and look to see which rules are implicated as to which of the different features of the, of the MPRM. Uh, so as you see for letters of protest, there's a tweak to 2.149 uh, for shortened response periods. These are all the rules that were implicated there. Here are the non-use cancellation rule sections that have been amended. There are some that are new. There are some that are just uh, amended to be conforming. And then we have recognition of representation and withdrawal rules as, as well as court orders. So those you can go back and uh, make sure you cover all the rules in the MPRM. Uh, I wanted to actually close my remarks with a suggestion. You might have noticed that as part of our initiatives to protect the integrity of the trademark register from false claims of use and fraudulent submissions more generally, we are implementing disincentives for maintaining inaccurate registrations, or perhaps I should say more directly, uh, we are incentivizing accurate registrations. Now one disincentive uh, implemented in January 2021 is the deletion fee uh, and the other is the TMA expungement and reexamination proceedings. So let me explain. The deletion fee is a $250 per class fee charged when goods and services are deleted in the context of a post-registration examination of a Section 8 or 71 declaration to maintain the registration. And this includes the post-registration audit process if you are selected for audit. Now to avoid the deletion fee, Registrants should file an accurate Section 8 or 71 declaration that reflects only the goods and services for which the mark is in current use. If you fail to do that and you are uh, you're targeted in an audit or in a post-registration uh, proceeding, uh, you will have to if you're if you're forced to delete goods and services, you will have to pay the $250 per class deletion fee 
And if you fail to pay the deletion fee, your entire registration is canceled. Non-response is not an option. Now, outside of the context of the Section 8 and 71 declaration examination, registrants should keep their registrations clear of any goods and services on which the mark is not in current use at all times. So to incentivize this behavior, the USPTO established a zero fee uh, for filing a Section 7 amendment that deletes unused goods and services from the registration at any time outside of an audit. I'm sorry, outside of a post-registration examination for the maintenance filing. So I highly recommend that registrants and their representatives review their registrations for accuracy and make adjustments now through this zero fee, this no fee process for doing so, for fixing up the registration and clearing the deadwood from your own registrations. And I would add that doing so would be a really easy way to avoid having one's registration targeted uh, for an expungement or reexamination proceeding. So that was my public service announcement uh, to clean up your registrations early and often. And so now um, I would like to hear what you all have to say. Uh, we have uh, five speakers signed up to provide uh, questions or comments. And after that, we will take questions uh, via the email box uh, that Tasha indicated. For those of you who did not sign up for a speaking slot, you can email your TMA NPRM related questions to the TM underscore webinar at USPTO.gov box, and we will attempt to answer them here today. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it back to Tasha uh, to let us know who the speakers are uh, who have signed up. Good afternoon. The first speaker is David Rome. There we are. Thank you so much. You can hear me though, right? Yes. Wonderful. I can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I had a quick question for this session. Um, one of the most surprising parts of the NPRM for me was um, the fact that petitions for expungement and reexamination would be immediately uploaded into the TSDR. Um, and, and that really factors into sort of strategic considerations in, in filing those kinds of petitions. Um, and I was wondering to what extent was that maybe a technical requirement, um, you know, because I really expected that to work maybe more like a letter of protest. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, because the purpose of the proceedings is to clear Deadwood off of the register, um, and because the evidence submitted to the office um, is something that the office is considering whether to make the prima facie case um, whether it makes a prima facie case to institute proceedings. Um, for, our, for our purposes, all of that information needs to be made public uh, immediately, and, and immediately so that the registrant whose registration is the subject of the filed petition uh, has you know, notice early and often uh, that, uh, that they may be subject to these proceedings if they are instituted. So we wanted to get that information uploaded as quickly as possible. Now, to the extent that 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 raises issues for others who are looking at the registration. They might want to, you know, if they have evidence about, you know, other goods and services in that in that same registration, they might want to file their own petition. But it certainly is something that we we didn't see any reason to keep that um, non-public uh, because that 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 information may be useful to others who are looking to see if a registration uh, that is blocking them uh, from from applying uh, is is not in use and needs to be uh, expunged. So, or, or re-examined for that matter. So we didn't really, it wasn't a technical requirement so much as just that the purpose and the intent of the proceedings was to uh, get Deadwood off the register uh, and have, have folks bring that information forward uh, wherever, wherever it resides and bring it forward to us so we can decide whether the evidence rises to the level of uh, a prima facie case of non-use. So I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, yeah, it does. That's very helpful. Um, it's just to take that into consideration when putting together more formal comments. Great. I look forward to seeing them. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Zengha Wafimi. Hi, good afternoon. Hello, good to see you again. <laughs> yes, um, I want to uh, say a thank you to the USPTO for this roundtable. Um, I will definitely be re-watching this as soon as it's available. And I want to be, um, share my gratitude for the willingness to discuss these changes, as well as the opportunity to get some feedback from us out here in the trenches. 
I would like to submit comments regarding the um, shorter three month response period for office actions and such. Um, under, um, we were today, we discussed three different options. Uh, Deputy Commissioner Cotton did delineate that for us. And um, it just took me back to the round table we had back in February, I think it was. There were quite a few attorneys and business advocates on that um, round table. They were speaking out against the examiners, one, having discretion to decrease the response time um, from the typical six months. And I didn't submit uh, comments against this particular change in light of the fact that applicants do have an opportunity to request an extension of that time. We all know, many of us know that oftentimes uh, applicants do not need the entire six months to respond to an office action. We also know that um, busy, busy um, business owners and innovators, entrepreneurs, they just get super busy. And so for that reason, I'm highly hesitant to even advise them that they have six months um, many times they wait until five months and 25 days before supplying that information that was requested of them. So closing the gap to three months, I definitely support. However, also in that uh, roundtable in February, various advocates spoke out against the attending uh, filing fee for the request to extend it beyond the three months. And I would just like the USPTO to reconsider that um, $125, $125 as excessive for such a request. I'm so glad that today we were able to discuss two other options. Um, in this case, coming from a litigation background, I kind of look at that request as like a motion to extend time to produce or, or uh, you know, you need time to provide an answer for something. And if I were to look at our litigation system, although that is not what this is, and consider those type of motion fees, I'm in New York. So um, when I refer to New York State Supreme Court fees, uh, looking at the US District Court fees, the federal court fees, and even the United States Supreme Court fees, nothing approaches $100. Nothing's approaching $100 for those type of motions. So in light of the foregoing, <laughs> Um, I respectfully request the USPTO to reconsider this fee as excessive on behalf of Artworks and the, the um, businesses that we serve. I support either of the two options, and I'm actually going to look at it a little bit more and submit formal comments. And just thinking about the fact that I think it was the third quarter of 2020, in the United States, there was a surge in business filings, nearly 80% increase due to the pandemic. Now, I don't know if it's because people were bored at home and they decided to create, or if the quarantine allowed uh, time for creativity to explode or expand. Either way, these are the businesses and the individuals that we serve. These are the new businesses, the small businesses, and they matter. And from my own experience as a director of an organization that runs a nonprofit legal services program, this fee is excessive for them. Any additional fee is excessive for them. Legal fees are excessive for them. And, um, you know, I just want to remind us all of President Biden's um, April uh, 2021 Proclamation on World Intellectual Property Day in honor of the 75th anniversary of the Lanham Act that Commissioner Gooder just referred to. The opening preamble of that proclamation. President Biden went straight to, we are celebrating inventors, innovators, and the creators that enrich our lives, right? These are the people that create the products, services, companies, industries of tomorrow. It was very, I don't want to say dramatic proclamation, but the pro proclamation itself recognized the power of intellectual property protection for our small businesses, enabling them to compete, thrive, and play an important role as the heart, and these are his words, as the heart and soul and the engine of our economic uh, progress. He went on even further to say that this is critical to our success as a nation. And these are the inventors, these are the innovators, these are the creators that we advocate for at Artworks. They make up 90% of businesses in the US. They employ nearly half of America's private sector workers. And um, President Biden cited that they create two thirds of new jobs. So I, I'm constantly always trying to advocate for these people. And even though some of us may figure, oh, 125, 75, 50, that's not a lot. You're talking about people um, that have inventions, as President Biden said, born in the garages of small towns, right? And they should have 
be on equal footing as those uh, inventions are developed in high tech labs. So this year, this world, this year's um, World Intellectual Property Day, he made sure President Biden that it highlighted the critical roles that these small businesses play for the resilience and the growth of our economy. And if this proclamation is any indication of where our country is heading, I'm all for it. Um, we have to focus on them, and I don't want to. Would it beat a dead horse? <laughs> Hopefully the horse isn't dead, but this is necessary for new businesses so that they have opportunities. It's it, it's necessary for great economic prosperity for our country. And so um, in interest of not beating that horse, <laughs> I want to close out to say um, that I request that the USPTO reconsider the new filing fees. And this is just one. Um, I'm going to present a uh, more in-depth um, comments that really address all of the things. I do not believe applying a fee that exceeds even the fees by our state courts, our federal district courts, um, even the highest court of our nation, the United States Supreme Court, in any way encourages the creativity that President Biden encouraged and which is also at the core of the Lanham Act. So let's get behind our small businesses and if a fee is imposed, I'm going to support one that considers the economic nature of the applicant. So thank you for an opportunity to share that and I will be submitting um, formal comments. Thank you very much, and I look forward to, to reading your comments. Uh, yes, it's, it's certainly always a balance, right? How do you promote access uh, to, the, to the IP system? Uh, how do you cause, recover costs? We're, we're a fee-funded you know, fee agency, so we have to make sure that we cover our costs so that the system works for everybody. And then how do we make sure that we are uh, moving applications efficiently through the system and, and people aren't just uh, you know, waiting six months because they can? You know, certainly right. trying to find that right balance is, is very difficult, so I absolutely appreciate your input on, on, on helping us to try to find that right balance. We, we need that input. We need those reminders uh, to, to find that, the right target, the right sweet spot that we can uh, do all of those things with one, with one, one choice. So I appreciate your, your input very much. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. You. And nice to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> you too. All right, Tasha, who else do we have? Final speaker for today will be Sylvia Esparza. She is online, but may be experiencing technical difficulties. Um, perhaps we should go to one of the audience questions while we um, work to get Sylvia um, as far as the online. Um, Great. Robert Lavash will be um, our moderator for our audience Q&A. And if anyone else in the audience has questions for our USPTO panel, you can email them now to tm underscore webinar at USPTO.gov. Thanks, Tasha. Uh, the first question we have concerns expungement proceedings. Um, and the question asks, am I correct that under the expungement procedure, three years of non-use is fatal even if the registrant has an intent to commence use or no intent not to commence use? So a foreign registration under 66A or 44E is fatally vulnerable if the mark is not put into use within three years after registration regardless of the factual circumstances, for example, attempts to license. Do you want to answer that, Bob? Well, I mean, I, I, the expungement uh, proceeding is available for all those bases. So then the question then becomes um, whether the petition and then during the course of the proceeding, non-use is established. So in that case, I think the answer is yes, it's, uh, it's potentially fatal for it. Um, applications under 66 or 44. That is my reading as well. Um, under the treaty, those uh, the treaty entitlement is that use needs to be made um, at least three years after the registration. And if it's not, it could be on the third, on the first day, last day of the third year, and that would save it. But if it's not put into use within three years post-registration, then it is subject to cancellation um, at the board, and it is uh, subject to an expungement uh, proceeding b before the director. So, yay, we agree. Um, <laughs> uh, let me just read. Let's see. I might be misunderstanding. Right, yeah. I'm just looking at the timing provisions. You can request it at any time following the expiration of three years after registration. So that's, that's consistent with that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
there's nothing else to add to that question. The other one concerned uh, our attorney recognition proposals. And the question is, PTO will notify, oh, before we move on, uh, one of our viewers has asked about excusable non-use uh, for that question. Yes, ex excusable non-use would be an option in the expungement proceeding. Correct, Amy? Yes. So moving on to the attorney recognition uh, question, PTO will notify registrant and counsel of rec record of cancellation requests, but per Team EP Section 60402, the attorney-client relationship in the PTO terminates upon issue of the registration unless counsel initiates contact. There's otherwise no counsel of record over an issued registration, as I understand it. PTO notification to the last counsel of record is therefore not effective to give notice to the registration, correct? The rule provides, I believe, um, that we will notify both uh, the registrant and the registrant's attorney. Now, under our current rule, technically, we're not supposed to let the registrant attorney, we're not supposed to notify the registrant attorney under our current rule because doing so would violate our correspondence rules. However, in this situation, we wanted to make sure uh, that both the registrant and the registrant's last attorney of record were aware. So that's, that's actually consistent with our practice, not our rule, um, to give a courtesy email to both the registrant and the registrant's attorney that the filing of a petition to request uh, institution of proceedings for expungement and reexamination was filed. Um, now, of course, we want to amend our recognition rules so that we would be notifying the registrant and the registrant's attorney consistent, well, we would then theoretically just uh, notify the, the, re the registrant's attorney, but we've carved out this proceeding so that it's very clear um, that we, we will notify both the registrant and the registrant's attorney. So this is an exception that we built into the rule um, so that we could make sure that we were sending the notification to as many parties as possible to let them know that this was filed. Is that a fair reading, Bob? Yeah, I mean, that goes to the very heart of the issue we're trying to resolve with the proposed rules. We're trying to uh, make our practice consistent with the rule. Um, and as it is, as it stands, we, although recognition of the uh, uh, registrant attorney ends that registration, we do act currently keep the attorney of record in the, in the record. Um, uh, once the, if, if we, if the proposed rules um, go through, as we envision them, that hopefully would be resolved, that inconsistency. Yes. All right. Um, moving on, this question concerns Section 7. Following uh, Deputy Commissioner Cotton's suggestions, is it envisioned that a Section 7 could preclude an expungement or reexamination for a registration in whole or in part? The answer is yes, uh, to the extent that the Section 7 amendment process was used to delete unused goods or services prior to the filing of a petition to expunge or reexamine those goods, um, then the, the, it wouldn't be an issue because uh, those would no longer be in, in the registration. Now, if once a petition is filed for expungement or reexamination as to those goods, the registrant has the option of filing a Section 7 amendment for zero fee to delete those goods or services. That would work then as a response to the office action as long as the examiner is notified by the registrant that that happened. So to the extent that the Section 7 process is not part of the expungement and reexamination process, if something happens over there, that needs to be notified over here. Uh, so that the uh, expungement or reexamination uh, examiner can be aware of it and determine whether that moots the proceeding. Uh, and it, it certainly would. If, if the deletion is uh, accepted under the Section 7 process, it would moot the proceeding for expungement and reexamination as to the deleted goods or services. But again, the, the registrant must respond and tell us that that happened uh, so that, that we are aware that that it, it happened uh, and uh, is a, is a re, you know acceptable response to the uh, office action for the reexamination or the expungement. Bob, do you have anything to add to that? I do not. Okay. 
Amy, All right. uh, Gary uh, Rogers here. May I add something to that? Absolutely. Uh, I do want people to be cognizant of the fact that if the party whose registration is the subject to the expungement proceeding also happens to be involved in a TTAB proceeding that was suspended because of the expungement or reexamination proceeding, uh, that Section 7 change or any action taken in regard to the registration could have consequences for the TTAB proceeding, even if it would moot the expungement proceeding. It may not moot the TTAB proceeding. It could possibly result in a judgment in the TTAB proceeding. So just a little complicating factor. If both proceedings are pending at the same time and the board has suspended the TTAB proceeding. Great. Thank you, Jerry, for adding that. I appreciate the perspective. Right. And I think, think this next one is also for Judge Rogers. Uh, currently, the three-year abandonment presumption can be overcome in a cancellation proceeding by showing an intent to commence use. It is not the case at the board that three years on, on non-use automatically equals cancellation. So is this expungement rule going to apply in cancellation proceedings so that the three years of non-use results not just in a presumption of abandonment, but automatic cancellation. Well, I can the answer what the intent was, but Jerry, if you want to go ahead. Go ahead. You start, Amy, and I'll jump in. Uh, the expungement proceeding is not an abandonment proceeding. Uh, it was not designed that way. If the mark was never in use, and use is required under the to, to be a trademark under the definition of a trademark, use is required. If it was never in use and it was supposed to be in use, it is not a trademark under the definition. So then abandonment is a separate issue, uh, and it, it doesn't apply. Abandonment as, is as to a mark that, that met the definition, uh, and uh, that's not what we're talking about here. So from that perspective, uh, for an expungement proceeding before the board, um, it would match what, what's happening in, in the director-ordered proceeding in that it's not an abandonment proceeding, so the intent issue is out of the picture. That's not the case for a non, you know, a regular abandonment proceeding before the board. But Jerry, I'm sure you're going to answer that question a lot, a lot more uh, academically than I will. Actually, I will probably uh, defer to your statement of the intent of the rule, and we may address this further in the final rule, where we would comment on any you know, suggestions or report any comments and suggestions that were received. Uh, and respond to them. Uh, but ultimately, if there are issues raised before the board, we will have to decide those issues when they are raised. Um, clearly, your statement now is that the intent, I think your, your statement now is that our attendees should look at an expungement claim brought at the TTAB as different than a traditional abandonment or non-use claim, and therefore, of the expungement rules would apply in the TTAB proceeding uh, in the same way that they would apply uh, in the expungement ex parte proceeding. I should stay in my lane, shouldn't I? <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm just saying everything is open to potentially being brought before the board in the future, and uh, of course we'll have to decide those issues if and when they come up. Right. But I think it's always good for everyone to understand what the intent of the office is and for anyone who has concerns about uh, a rule possibly having consequences different than what we intend them to do to provide us with their comments so that we can consider them. Great. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you for the question. All right, next question is, is there a time frame within which the office hopes to issue notices of determination in ex parte proceedings, similar to two months for a letter of protest or a similar target pendency? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to understand the question. Is there a time frame within which the office hopes to issue notices de of determination? Oh, oh, How quickly I see. are we so going to terminate what, what the proceedings? The um, I think that remains to be seen on uh, volume. 
wouldn't you say, Bob? Uh, you know, we're we're hoping to turn yeah. the intent of the proceedings is to be as fast as possible, uh, because this is supposed to be a way to get Deadwood off the register quickly, so that uh, folks can you know apply to get on the register who are actually putting the marks to use. Um, so the idea is that we would be under you know time frames in, within the office as best we can to try to move these uh, efficiently through. Uh, but because we have no idea how how many of these we will get, um, it is hard to, you know, set the time frames now, uh, but the, certainly the intent is to move quickly. Anything to add, Bob? Uh, no, just that, you know, there is the four months total of response time period um, built into the proposed rule, right? So you have two months to respond to the non-final and then two months uh, at the final office action stage to issue either a request for reconsideration or an appeal. Um, so that there's four months right there, and then you'd have to take into account um, the additional review and processing that the office has to undertake for these. But yes, the the intent is to do these as quickly as possible. Um, the other question we had uh, from the same questioner is, what is the purpose for the additional explanation of the factual statement of the relevant basis for a petition, which is not required by statute? if only one claim and one registration is permitted per petition. Bob, you got that one? Yeah, I think the purpose of it is, it, it is I don't know if it's explicitly required by the uh, TMA, but it, you do need to specify in your petition what, what exactly you're claiming. Are you claiming, uh, are you seeking a, an expungement proceeding where you're saying there's never been use, or are you seeking a reexamination? Uh, proceeding where you're you're saying that use hasn't been made as of a certain date, so that's that's the reason um, for that factual statement. I don't think it's intended to be um, uh, overly complicated or, or burdensome. I was looking in the statute, and I'm not seeing anything. It's uh, additional facts that support the allegation that the mark has never been used in commerce. But yeah, I think I think it was just a, a, as Bob said to be very clear. Uh, what is being alleged. All right. Okay, anything else to add? Uh, there's a question, how much of the TMA was driven by the types of applications we've been receiving over the past few years? Uh, well, I think if you go to the legislative history uh, for the, the Trademark Modernization Act, uh, there was a um, explicit you know, mention that the that the congressional intent was to address um, an influx of applications featuring uh, suspicious specimens of use. Uh, that that perhaps the, the specimens of use that we were receiving in applications uh, was were not accurate, were fake or doctored, or or, or just didn't reflect actual use in commerce. Uh, so uh, I think it's it was built into the to the legislative history that 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 certainly was uh, to address an influx of applications. Now, I don't think it's specifically as to where those applications were originating, but um, certainly it was to address um, fraudulent submissions and, and uh, fake or digitally altered specimens of use that don't reflect actual use in commerce. Anything to add there? Nothing from me. Okay. All right, the next question, noting the current heavy workload in the examining core, will expungement and reexamination be handled by the existing examination core or a new group? Um, the answer to that question is um, yet unknown. Uh, we're still deciding um, how these will be handled. Uh, certainly, um, we will be you know, developing guide, internal guidance uh, as, as the uh, final rule takes shape. We will determine uh, what what that guidance looks like, and uh, and then who best should uh, apply that guidance uh, in examination. So I think we will um, that will be something that we will be determining in the com coming months. And Bob, it looks like it. we got a comment. Uh, we got a comment about use is not required for a uh, Paris or a Madrid filing. That is right. Use is not required. Uh, as a condition to obtain the registration, but use is required as a condition to maintain the registration, and it must be used um, within the first three years post-registration. As that that moment that it is not used when it's required to be used, 
um, then it is not a mark. It is a prospective mark until then. The rights don't vest, uh, but then then it, it it is at that point. So I think the the issue of the definition of a trademark was what the uh, the commenter was raising. Um, but that was simply the the theory behind why expungement was something other than abandonment. Um, uh, that was the, the underpinnings of, of the thinking of, of the office and of congressional uh, staff who were working on the, the TMA in developing the proposal. So I just wanted to address that. All right. And our next question, how will brand owners be able to search in test, test to find which registrations have expungement and or reexamination proceedings that were instituted? Uh, Based on how TESS works, uh, you will not be able to do that uh, because currently the status, um, that status would not be searchable in TESS. Um, so uh, that will not be an option. Um, I don't know, Amy, if you have anything to add to that. No, but presumably if you were searching tests and you found a problematic uh, application that was blocking or a registration that was blocking you in your clearance search, uh, you would probably dig deeper and go to the TSDR status tab where all of this information would be found. Uh, so if you found a problematic one, you would certainly be able to, to find out whether a proceeding was instituted very easily in the TSDR um, documents tab. It would be right there for you. All right, next question. The NPRM states that registrants that are subject to ex parte expungement or reexamination proceedings and show sufficient use in response cannot be challenged through the same type of proceedings again, but registrants that wish to amend their own registration should do so via Section 7 amendments. Shouldn't registrants that proactively amend their registrations be permitted to voluntarily submit evidence of use so as to avoid the possibility of expungement or reexamination and get the benefit of the preclusive effect? Uh, the insulation question. Um, this uh, this is something that, that we have uh, had stakeholders raise before. Um, what we recommend uh, is that if a registrant wants to provide evidence of use, proof of use, uh, through the Section 7 process, such that it, it would be entered into the file wrapper, um, certainly registrants can do that. Uh, the office would not be evaluating that proof of use to see if it meets requirements. Uh, so from that perspective, um, the registrant is free to do that, and that, that might be a good practice, uh, but it's not something that the office then would validate, if that makes any sense. We wouldn't examine uh, that proof of use as to each one. That would be an enormous workload for us to do. Uh, and so from a resource perspective, I don't, I don't think that's... Uh, um, that's that's feasible at this time, but certainly providing that evidence um, and and having it in the file wrapper through the Section 7 process would not um, would not be problematic. You would certainly be able to do that, uh, and that might uh, uh, be useful for folks who are who are looking at registrations and looking at your registration to figure out if um, if there's any uh, vulnerabilities, I should say. Um, but that's certainly there's an avenue to do that, but it's not something that the office would examine or validate if that makes if that makes sense. Bob, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, nothing other than just to say that that preclusive effect is derived from from the estoppel provisions in the TMA. So you know that's where that's coming from. So um, you know this voluntary submission would not really qualify under the statute for that preclusive effect. That's a great point. All right, we have a follow-up on the um, the three-year non-use. Um, how do you reconcile the three-year non-use drop-dead deadline uh, with a case? Let's see, let read it here. Federal Circuit has ruled that although the Trademark Act refers to abandonment, the allegation that a mark was never used pleads a necessary non-use for abandonment so long as the period of non-use is at least three years or of less than three years is accompanied by lack of intent to resume or commence use. So again, I the am question of... I familiar with the case. No. So meaning that, okay, uh, this is a treaty interpretation issue. <laughs> uh, fun. Um, so the implementation of um, the treaty provisions regarding non-use cancellation 
um, the U.S. Um, initially implemented those uh, through the doctrine of abandonment. Um, no, let me back up. Abandonment, again, the, the Trademark Modernization Act creates a, a new ground for cancellation and a new proceeding um, for a mark that has never been used. So it is creating a new type of, of cancellation that is not abandonment. Uh, so to the extent that there is abandonment case law that addresses uh, Section 44, in that case it was a Section 44 registration, um, it is not applicable to the TMA provision. It is a different provision. Uh, so I'm certain, ha certainly happy to have a conversation with the commenter uh, about treaty interpretations, but I don't know that it's the best use of our time here today. Um, but we can certainly have that, that conversation offline. Bob, do we have any other questions coming in? As far as I can tell, that that was it. Yes, that was the last question that we received from um, the audience. Ms. Esparza, if you are available for our June 14th roundtable, then we hope that you will be able to return then and provide your comments or um, submit them. Um, at this time, we'll move um, forward with closing remarks from Chief Administrative Trademark Judge Gerard Rogers. Thank you, Tasha. I will uh, focus just for a moment on uh, the TTAB's role in all of this proposed rulemaking. Uh, obviously, we are a small part of some very significant changes to practice uh, that are of interest uh, and potentially of concern to both registrants and uh, would-be petitioners or erstwhile petitioners. Uh, so one could look at the TMA's provisions and the proposed rules as really just providing uh, or concerning the TTAB to the extent that we have to establish uh, procedures for handling appeals from examiner reviews of expungement and reexamination proceedings and their final determinations. And those appeals, of course, are going to be handled in the same way procedurally that our existing appeals are. Uh, of course, the substantive issues that will be before us when we are reviewing those appeals uh, will be different uh, in kind from uh, the existing appeals that we now hear. Uh, we also, of course, have to set up uh, a way for our systems to accept uh, and uh, to process uh, appeals involving registrations, which did not exist before. We've always had appeals involving applications. So there's the IT work that we're doing to allow for appeals involving registrations rather than applications. Uh, of course, we also have the TMA's provision of an expungement ground for cancellation. And I think some of the questions uh, that we've heard today uh, bring up uh, the, the issue of, is that expungement claim that can be brought in a cancellation proceeding at the TTAB uh, significantly different than existing abandonment or non-use claims? Now, to the extent that we are contemplating expungement as a claim brought at the board as akin to expungement brought in an ex parte proceeding before the examining operation, uh, you might have to think of it as a different claim. And I think Congress has made it clear that they were not supplanting or offering expungement as a claim at the TTAB uh, as a replacement for anything that already existed. So our existing case law will continue to influence how we decide abandonment and non-use claims, um, fraud claims, and things like that. Uh, but we may have to develop new case law to influence how we decide uh, the expungement claims that will be potentially brought once the TMA takes effect. Uh, so we do have to, I think, think of expungement as a new type of claim at the board, and we will see how we will handle it. Uh, and until we get those claims and have to decide them on the merits, uh, we probably will have little to say about it until we uh, have to say something about it. Uh, 
The other thing that I think is important for our stakeholders and our customers to keep in mind is the interplay between TTAB proceedings uh, and these new proceedings. Uh, as one of our speakers, uh, one of our commenters uh, said, uh, this is not litigation. The new ex parte proceedings before the examining operation are not litigation. TTAB litigation involving an expungement claim would be litigation. Uh, so the new proceedings are additional tools in the toolkit of anyone who is interested in removing a blocking registration or perhaps removing a registration that may not be blocking but for other reasons you, you may think it just shouldn't be on the register. Uh, the standing requirement now known because of Federal Circuit case law as the entitlement to a statutory cause of action uh, is present in the TTAB proceeding but not in the proceedings being brought uh, in the ex parte context. Uh, as one speaker already pointed out, you also have all of the information you gathered during your investigation that you are filing with your ex parte proceeding and if it is instituted, it, that information is uploaded uh, right away. Whereas if you bring an expungement claim at the board, it's notice pleading to get that started and you may not be providing a lot of information other than your allegations in your petition to get that proceeding up and, and running. Uh, there are strategic considerations that people will have to consider whether they want to go to the board where they can couple an expungement claim with additional claims where they have the possibility of a quick default judgment uh, which might be even quicker than a resolution in one of the ex parte proceedings uh, where you can go to trial and get discovery on those other claims if you think it's important to bring not just an expungement claim uh, but also to bring some other claims. Um, so I think the statute and the proposed rules give us a lot of pause and a lot to think about uh, and open up new opportunities um, for all of us to think about. Uh, and hopefully choices are a good thing in this context uh, when the legislation provides those choices. Uh, so with that, uh, I will thank those people who have spoken and provided comments and uh, echo the, uh, the remarks of Commissioner Gooder earlier that uh, we are interested in all comments, informal or formal, but as Deputy Commissioner Cotton pointed out, if it's formal, you may see it summarized in the final rule. If it's informal, we'll certainly consider it, uh, but it may not be in the rules, uh, in the final rule package. Thank you, Tasha. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Chief Judge Rogers. And thank you all for, you all for attending our roundtable today and for providing questions and comments. Um, as all of our speakers have mentioned, if you want to provide formal comments on the Trademark Modernization Act Notice of Proposed Rulemaking that will be part of the official record and reviewed and responded to in the final rulemaking, please submit them at www.regulations.gov by July 19th. This roundtable was recorded and the video along with the slides will be made available on our website within two to three weeks. We will email links to all that signed up to it um, to attend today once these materials are available online. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.